Joining me today, we have the man who literally put the stitched leather into iOS. Former Apple designer, former Double Twist designer, longtime iconographer, and right now working on an app called Halide. How are you, Sebastian? I'm great, Renee. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. So, uh, you did a series of posts about shooting raw on iPhone that were just breathtaking, uh, eye popping. I don't know. I don't know all the superlatives I'm supposed to use for it. Uh, but it was really impressive, and I thought it'd be great to sit down and sort of talk to you because I think people hear raw and they get really excited, but then they might think about trying it and get a little bit intimidated. And I wanted to maybe demystify it and figure out where people can start making much better photos. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, of course, the iPhone already has an amazing camera, so you know a lot of people actually start with the thought like, why would I even want to change from like the stock camera app? But the reality of it is. Uh, raw is like a way to get a lot more freedom when you're editing your photo. So if you're already doing stuff like editing your photos on Instagram, or maybe using apps like Lightroom or Darkroom uh, or Visco, uh, using Raw is a really good way to give yourself a bit more freedom. So what is Raw? Like if someone has only heard the term but they don't know what it is, what is a Raw file? When a camera takes a photo, um, it does a lot of things. It takes in like all this light and then there's a tiny little square behind the camera lens on your phone that turns that light into a signal. Now, usually quickly, your phone takes all that data, does a bunch of magic to it, and creates a processed image. So it kind of applies some magic to make it look as good as possible and creates a final image. A raw file is basically taking all that information that it captured and not doing any of the processing. So you just get exactly what the camera saw. Okay. Right out of the camera, it might not look as good, but you'll get a little bit more information. And um, given some massaging, you might be able to get something special out of it. What is shooting raw like on an iPhone? Is it shooting raw like you'd think about on a DSLR or a traditional camera? It's mostly the same, but there's a few key differences. What's really different on your iPhone is that you will immediately notice that you lose a few things, which I kind of refer to as Apple secret sauce. Yes. So the camera does a couple really special things. They've got super smart people at Apple working on this stuff. Um, and things like noise reduction and... Um, one little thing which most people don't know is when you take a photo on your iPhone, it'll basically take like 20 of them, find the sharpest one, automatically select it so you see the sharpest possible image. A raw photo won't do that. You'll just get one shot and it will be looking, it'll probably look a little noisier than, than it would on um, just this normal camera app. So just to dive deeper a second, Apple has the, they've been doing the A-series chips for a while and part of the A-series chips is an image signal processor, an ISP, and that does all these things like auto white balance, auto focus, face detection, it removes noise, but then it detects textures like fabrics and tries to make the, no the, the compression not interfere with the patterns. It detects clouds and snow, and it does an incredible amount of work. And like you said, it takes a bunch of different photos and takes different pieces and tries to make that photo HDR and all these different things to give you... The idea is that you can take the phone out of your pocket and shoot a photo. It'll be the best possible photo given those circumstances. But there are some people, I, you know, I, I think you're certainly an example. When I shoot on a, on a DSLR, I'm an example. You want maximum control, not maximum convenience. Totally. And it's just, you know, raw on iPhone, we have to say, is a fairly new thing. So as developers, we only got this maybe a little over a year ago. We got full access to do stuff like this, get, you know, all the data from the sensor and kind of have manual settings and such. We'll get to that in a bit. But um, I think maybe in the future, it'll be more like um, on like a pro level camera or like a, you know, a normal camera where the raw file will have a bunch of the magic applied to it. So like on an SLR, as you have probably noticed, noise reduction is applied to the RAW yes. file. So you get a pretty noise-free RAW file. They're pretty comparable to uh, the normal JPEG file you get out of the camera. Um, on the iPhone, it's not the case yet, but I suspect that's part of it is because it's just so new. Uh, it's just a fairly new feature to have on the iPhone. And it's like, I mean, people who've been shooting with Nokia phones or some Android phones are laughing like, ha ha ha, you invented RAW in, in 2017 <laughs> or 2016, whenever it was. Uh, but I think Apple deliberately tried to keep the built-in camera app super simple so that people could just use it out of the box and not worry about it. When you were working on Highlighted, what were your design goals in terms of raw and manual? How did you want to expose settings but not introduce a lot of complexity? What we wanted to do is kind of strike the middle ground in that. And the way we did that is by basically looking at an existing camera and um, kind of mimicking the UI you see on that. So if you hold a camera, if you give the child a camera, the first thing they'll do is click the buttons and like twist the wheels and stuff. There's a very intuitive thing to like how tactile it is. It's very satisfying. Now to kind of try to replicate that on the iPhone, we decided we needed sort of canonical gestures. Yeah. Um, the 
gesture of choice on the stock camera app is tapping. It's kind of one dimensional input method. You say, this is a point of interest and your camera will kind of try to figure out from your tap, should it be in focus, should it be exposed, both. And the very common frustration point on that is now your flower is in focus, but the whole background is too bright. Yeah. And HDR tries to like kind of take that away, but it can't perfectly do it. Maybe you just want to tell your camera, I just want the flower to be in focus. The exposure is fine, don't touch that. Yeah. So we went one dimension up, we went two dimensions. So you can swipe up and down on the viewfinder anywhere, anywhere on the screen, uh, whether you're lefty or righty, to get the exposure up and down to make it brighter or darker, which happens to mirror the way a camera works. You know, usually have an exposure wheel that you also twist that way. And with for focus, you can swipe left and right. Um, so normally you have autofocus enabled, but even if you swipe left on autofocus, you don't have to tap anything, it'll go right into manually focusing. And then if you swipe to the left, you'll focus something a little closer to you. And if you swipe to the right, far away, which is the same way a lens adjusts, basically. If you're holding a camera like this, left and right, left is closer, right is further. So that was kind of like the initial setup. And then within that, we added a few toggleable features like Say you wanted to run raw on or off, or you want to control white balance. That's all behind like an extra tap, but basically the same level of adjustment. Yeah, it's interesting because we went from the Mike Mattis era, the original iPhone app, which had like the shutter animation, and it it it, it did have a bunch of real chunky uh, photorealistic elements. And then we went to the Johnny era with iOS seven, which became much flatter <laughs> and much darker and much sort of like rendered flat for digital screens where you have the playfulness in the interactivity. Totally, yeah. I mean, like you mentioned, the old camera app was literally metal. Like it was yeah. actually kind of modeled after a real camera. And uh, I always loved that the old camera icon also was a camera lens and it was sitting right over where the camera was behind your, yeah. uh, behind the screen. That was kind of a cool touch. But yeah, we were in an era right now where like a lot of the playfulness in apps, I think, comes out of interactivity. Uh, and so apart from the fact that we made the shutter button kind of a wink, it's a little tactile, it's got a bit of a gradient on it, yes. I couldn't resist it. Um, I, I'm still me. Uh, but uh, everything else is like really in the gestures and like how things interact. And we kind of went to the next level with that with the iPhone 10, where we were like, maybe we can make it really pleasant to use with one hand because it's just such a, it's such a tall device yeah. to hold. Maybe we can make sure that everything is a kind of like under your thumb right here. Yeah, I have and, it up uh, on, on a little tripod here. It's it's narrow so that you have the buttons, but you also, like, you, you use the horns, too. You went all in on the horns, and you have the Instagram on one side, and you have the, what is that inside? <laughs> the speed, right? Yeah, you can you can see the exposure compensation yeah. or, like, your, your, your shutter speed there. So what does your raw workflow look like when you're out and you want to shoot something and you know that you want to make a real, like, Instagram-worthy or uh, studio piece? What is your workflow like? <laughs> Um, usually, um, I, because we can't kind of override the really nice gesture on the phone where you can swipe left into the camera, um, I swipe, I, I use like a little lock screen widget, uh, probably not visible right now, but you can swipe left, add it to your today view. Yeah. You can one tap into it now. So I use Halide and then I usually have it already set up to automatically capture raw. Uh, I usually push the exposure down a little bit because um, it's better to make sure that you have every bright area well exposed. You can always bring the shadows up a little bit later. Um, and I snap the shot and then I either, depending on how close I am to a computer, I import it into Darkroom, uh, which is this wonderful app. It's actually free if you don't want to buy all the pro features. You can, you can grab that and uh, make your own preset. So I have a couple presets set up that I apply to it, see which one looks best, and then I put it on Instagram. If I'm near my Mac, I just airdrop it over and import it into Lightroom and then I edit it from there. And do you have sort of, is it based on feeling? Are there certain sort of like, you know, you're always going to crush the blacks or you're always going to boost the saturate. Are there sort of like a, a set thing you do or do you play it by ear? Well, I, I wrote a little bit about this in, in my second article about like editing raw. But for me, um, editing for a lot of people is kind of a creative choice. But a good thing to kind of keep in mind is try to trying to edit it in a way that makes it more representative of what you feel like you saw when you were, you were there, yeah. you know, so phones, all cameras actually, are legendarily bad at sunsets. <laughs> and the reason they're so bad at them is because the light gets colored and, and the, they can go into like how white balance works and like have a little long spiel. But the gist of it is once light starts being this particular color, your camera doesn't understand what's white anymore because white surfaces will reflect a colored light. Uh, and that's why your sunset photo never looks like what you see because your eyes are really good at figuring out white balance. So. I know in my mind what I saw. You probably thought, oh, it's a beautiful, it's like a peach. You know, you see the beautiful violet going to orange, going to yellow. Uh, try bringing that out. Uh, take your photo, especially a raw photo, uh, and, and try to see if you can bring out those colors so you can boost the saturation a little bit. 
but most apps nowadays have selective color adjustments yeah. so you could say I think I saw the purples being a little stronger the the reds have brought up a little bit it was a little warmer than the camera saw it and before you know it you'll actually have a, a photo that looks really good simply because you already knew how it looked good because your eyes saw it yeah so uh, one of the things that I find super interesting is like the different companies have different philosophies Apple which is famous for wanting to make all the decisions for you it, it, photo photographs are one of the things where they don't they try to reproduce as naturally as possible what comes off the the, uh, the sensor where uh, Samsung which has a lot of manual controls and a, like duplicate versions of every app uh, they, <laughs> they go for sort of making it look good for you and they they do crush the blacks and they do boost the sat and I find it super interesting that that's the one area where Apple wants to to not get up in your business yeah it's interesting that that's kind of their philosophy with displays and cameras right yeah. so you also see this like when the, with the Samsung OLED screens, like they're really punchy, typically on the oversaturated side. Uh, and that, that's where people see their strengths, like they're like they're really colorful screens. When Apple went with in all in on the OLED with the iPhone 10, you know, they made sure they probably went through crazy painstaking amounts yeah. of work to, to make sure that the colors are accurate, which may not mean what the average person even appreciates. But uh, if anyone is serious about photography or that kind of stuff, it's really, really nice. And it sort of, it gets to this insecurity that I have. It's my, it's my photography imposter syndrome that when I do crush blacks a little bit or boost saturation a little bit, I'm worried that I'm trying to make it look like a Best Buy television set. Oh yeah, and it totally kills me too when you uh, do these adjustments and like there's one person who's like, oh, that's a little too much. And you're like, oh my God, I made it look cheap and, and, and bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you also support depth. Uh, there's a depthy API in iOS 11 and you support depth, but you have a really interesting way of handling, almost like a hinting feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kind of have started referring to it as depth peaking because there is such a thing as focus peaking. Yeah. You can, your camera will kind of point out what's in focus. Um, we are pretty close to releasing a new version of Halide, which is entirely focused on depth capture, uh, which is pretty crazy. There's a couple of really crazy features in it. Um, depth is a really new thing. There's very few cameras out there that basically have two cameras working together to capture 3D data. Uh, and your iPhone out of the box does it with portrait mode. So it can see the difference between the two images, see the depth, and that's how it applies the blur behind people. Uh, there's more applications than that. In fact, we had a lot of people from the visual effects industry contact us saying like, hey, how can we get the depth data out of a photo so we can play with it and make something crazy? Uh, and we said, we don't have a way right now. It's really cool to hear that people want to do something like that with it. Um, so the last month, two months, we've been working on really trying to make the best camera also for depth. Yeah, and this is where I get every Android or Google aficionado in the world angry with me. But there was that line at the Google hardware event when they announced the Pixel 2 where they said that we don't need two cameras to get depth effect. And Google is super clever. They deserve a lot of credit because they take the, the focus pixels on their phase adjust focus system and they use that to get a couple layers of parallax. But they're really, really good at segmentation masking. So they can figure out uh, algorithmically what is ahead, pull that out and then apply a blur to everything else. But there's not a lot of depth data, and there's zero, I believe, on the front camera, where Apple, at least on the iPhone 10, or the iPhone 7, they were getting nine, I think it was nine layers of depth data. I don't even know what they're getting on the iPhone 10, but they're getting multiple layers of depth data. And the the uh, front camera, too, is getting, multi, I think, probably even better, uh, more granular depth data. And that means that for applications like yours, if you don't have access to the Google algorithm, you still have all that raw data. And like you said, special effects people, they may not care about doing a depth blur, they may well have totally other things in mind for those. Totally, and the other key benefit is, and this is what people with the new Pixels are really astonished by when they move there from an iPhone, you can't do any real-time yeah. stuff. So the iPhone camera can show you how a portrait photo is gonna look, but with the Pixel, you just have to wait until it's done processing and then it'll spit out an image that, you know, it's a pretty decent background blur, but. Pixel 2 XL, I want to shoot portrait mode. I don't see it anywhere. I try the menu button, I scan down. Oh, there it is. Uh, but I, I don't see portrait mode. I don't know if it's working or not. Maybe my phone is broken. I, I don't know. I take the picture. Anyway, I still don't see anything. I check the picture just in case. And then it applies the portrait mode after a second or two. iPhone 10, I see the word portrait mode. I tap on it, it switches. I see the portrait mode effect. So I know it's working, I tap the button, I shoot it, and if I want to see it, I just tap again. I find it disturbing because I'm used to shooting with, uh, with traditional cameras where, like if I have a Fast 50 on there, I see what's in focus and what's not in focus, and that informs my decision of how I want to take the photo. And on the iPhone, if there's, because no blur, no blur effect is perfect, if I see aberrations, 
like around someone's glasses or their nose or something. I can turn a few degrees to try to get the best photo I can. Where on my Pixel 2 XL, I take the photo, I look, ah, it's wrong. I go back, take the photo again, ah, still no. No, that's really frustrating. You're right. And that's, that's I mean, that, that really deserves a lot of credit. Um, there's an incredible amount of power required to do that. And, in, and a huge, there's buckets of smarts from Apple on, on doing that. It's, it's really, really impressive that they pulled this off. Yeah, the old joke for me was that Nokia had put really big glass on their cameras. Apple had really amazing image signal processors. And Google had no idea what the hardware was that you were shooting with. So they would just suck everything up into the cloud and auto awesome it. But I think it's interesting that Apple is, is stuck with uh, solid hardware and increased their signal processing. So now they can do things like they, they have all that hardware and it's just a matter of what your software can do. Where I think the Pixel 2 is bound by what the software can do. And you can't, you can't just add a better camera to it. It's true, yeah. And I think all the companies are running into the, the sort of physical limits of what yeah. we can do with the small size of a camera. Um, so I don't think we'll see huge leaps and bounds in camera quality, but all of them that we will see, we'll, like, we'll probably see much better photos coming out of our phones, but increasingly that will all be about the software. Uh, and it's interesting that we're, they're sort of knocking down things that you would traditionally need, like a big camera rig, big glass, studio lights, uh, a, an actual physical green screen to do. And we're trying to do all this stuff with just atoms and bits. Yeah, and of course, now they're using different technologies as well to get depth data. So your, your iPhone 10 front-facing camera has the true depth camera, uh, and that has an astonishingly good idea of depth. It's a little bit more shallow, so it's about, I would say, about this much, this is the range of the depth that it captures, but your face will be extremely detailed in depth, where the dual camera is more about, you know, a couple feet away from you to yeah. how much further that is. And it's kind of a Trojan horse. This kind of technology will uh, enable AR, for instance, to be yeah. far, far better because it can sense the geometry of your room so much easier than, say, a pixel. So where do you find yourself shooting with iPhone and shooting with your Leica, for example, or Leica? Pronouncing everything wrong today. <laughs> um, well, there's still the big physical limit when it comes to shooting in the dark, right? So yeah. phones just don't handle that well. You've got a very small lens, a very small sensor. Not perfect yet, but I've barely taken out my real cameras lately, um, simply because a, I want to really make sure that I use my product a lot, uh, and B, because it, increasingly the phone is just that good. Uh, yeah. I don't really need it on like a sunny day anymore. I went sailing yesterday on the San Francisco Bay, uh, which was horrifying because we had 35 mile an hour winds and I thought I was going to die. Uh, and I thought, well, all this for a photo, all this for a raw shot, what will Renee think? Uh, but. I didn't take my camera out because I was like, I, I'm just going to dog food it. And I've been increasingly um, happier with that. But when we just got started, we had the 7 Plus, And I was like, mm, I'll take my camera w along as well. But increasingly, it's only for really specific things. So if you want to do some good portrait photos, uh, portrait mode is fantastic, but it can't beat a good portrait lens yeah. yet, especially when it comes to really shallow depths of field. And when it comes to like shooting at night, it's really nice to have a, a big sensor and a big camera for it. Yeah, beyond sneaker zoom, I mean, you've got 2x now, which is optical. But I, I find still, if you really want zoom, you still need to get one of those. Like, if I want to shoot a soccer game uh, or, yeah. or like an event, I still need to have actual big glass to do that. Totally wildlife, you know. Yeah. You can walk up to to a bird sometimes, but you know, zoom lens makes it a little easier. They're cagey. So, Sebastian, if people want to find out more about you, more about Halide, where can they go? Uh, we have a website at halide.cam, so C A M, and uh, I'm on Twitter at. At SDW. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Renee.